In the early 1970s, with the sudden rise to popularity of the Wankel engine in Mazda vehicles, along with increasing awareness of the need for responsible management of the Earth's limited resources, the time was right to reevaluate the internal combustion engine. Hi, I'm Ross Taylor. In those days, I was an environmentally aware youngster with a flair for thinking outside of the box. Consequently, I embarked on a decades-long quest to design a more compact and efficient engine. My initial designs were rotary, sparked by the Mazda design. There's an intuitive, though not necessarily accurate, sense that generating rotational motion from a rotating system should be better than converting linear or oscillating motion to rotation. Historically, rotary engine designs suffer from the following issues. Most do not use conventional valves and instead employ rotating elements to open and close intake and exhaust ports. This limits the use of pressurized lubricants and may result in burned ports. Most require complex seals between rotors and stators and often need high pressure moving seals in the combustion chamber. These seals are prone to failure and leakage. Many rotary designs employ complex mechanical controls or linkages which are prone to failure and loss of precision. Most significantly, all rotary engine designs suffer from extreme outward rotational forces which compromise seals and promote wear. One of my early, now obsolete, rotary engine design attempts suffered from all four of the issues, but as time progressed I replaced ports with conventional poppet valves and put critical seals where the use of conventional compression rings and commercially available shaft seals could be used. I also simplified the non-circular gear control mechanism. However, the issue of outward rotational forces was insurmountable, which would have resulted in compression rings pulling away from the cylinder walls and would have seized the valves at high rotational velocities. In 2010, I devised a way in which to change the frame of reference so that the pistons oscillated within fixed cylinders, practically eliminating the outward forces on all the components of the combustion chamber. The non-circular gear mechanism became the rotating element embodied in a planetary system. With a design that was no longer hampered by the most significant issue of my previous designs, I worked with the Research and Innovation Department at NATE, who, with the help of a grant-matched fund from within NATE, supported the development of a working compressed air-driven prototype completed and demonstrated in 2012. This led eventually to the issuing of a U.S. patent in December 2016. Over the years, numerous variants and configurations were proposed and modeled. Different linkages were tried, including non-circular ring gears, cams, crankshafts, and even closed-loop hydraulics. I settled on a design similar to the original concept, but without multiple concentric hollow shafts. Strength and reliability were improved by making the piston stationary within oscillating cylinders, and higher compression was achieved by putting the valves in the piston faces. Other supporting research included finite element analysis of critical parts, two structural engineering analyses, and a thermal engineering analysis. Considerable research focused upon the non-circular gears culminating in the use of double helical teeth to allow for high rotational velocities with no end thrust. Gear generation software was written and revised to ensure that the designs met structural and dynamic engineering standards. The feasibility of producing such gears was verified by makers of CNC-controlled gear shaping equipment. 3D printing, casting techniques, and multi-axis CNC milling were investigated, indicating that manufacturing the engine parts was feasible as well. At the same time, various engine cycles and fuels were researched. Significantly, the OPOC and Achates engines confirmed the increased efficiency advantages of opposed piston arrangements like mine. The Detroit diesel engine pointed to a compact, clean two-stroke design which does not require lubricating fuels or mixed fuel. Toyota's implementation of the Atkinson cycle validated the efficiency improvements of having a compression stroke that is shorter than the combustion stroke. Mazda's implementation of the Miller cycle showed the advantages of supercharging, which happens to be an integral part of the scavenging process for my clean two-stroke engine.
The differences between isentropic expansion and isothermic expansion were researched, and as different engine manufacturers investigated options like stratified charge ignition, homogeneous charge, and partial premix compression ignition, it became clear that my engine configuration could incorporate the advantages of most of these current and proposed designs. Meanwhile, market analysis indicated that I should find a more future-oriented application than the transportation market as the major automobile manufacturers have plans to phase out internal combustion engines. Given the need to replace coal-fired power plants and the inherent waste of burning fossil fuels to produce low-grade heat for residential hot water and space heating, I chose to focus on cogeneration of electricity and heat, or smaller combined heat and power generation systems. These alternate energy concepts have the potential to contribute significantly to the distributed generation of electricity while providing useful heat. Given the current availability, broad distribution, and the low cost of natural gas, coupled with the preference for natural gas as fuel in terms of carbon dioxide and other emissions, more research was done to see how the engine could be adapted to the use of residential pressure natural gas. There are clear indications that the engine is a prime candidate for the use of residential supply natural gas in the combined production of electricity and heat, and that an efficient internal combustion engine driving a grid-linked generator produces nearly the perfect ratio of heat to electricity for a typical Alberta dwelling. The current design is predicted to produce over 55 horsepower at 3600 rpm and approximately 85 horsepower at 6500 rpm. Given that it is 300 millimeters in diameter and less than 250 millimeters tall, with a mass under 40 kilograms, this engine promises to be a powerful yet compact, quiet, vibration-free device. At the core, two-cylinder assemblies oscillate over stationary piston assemblies. Two of the piston assemblies draw air into the superchargers, pictured in blue, and also draw in fuel, in this case natural gas, pictured in magenta, to the fuel compressors. The other two piston assemblies house the stationary components of the combustion chambers and have the exhaust valves occupying the majority of their faces, venting exhaust fumes, pictured in orange. These piston assemblies also house the stationary components of the fuel compressor pumps. Cooling channels throughout these assemblies, pictured in turquoise, remove heat generated during combustion. The oscillating cylinder assemblies contain the intake valves for both air and fuel. The intake valves are not cam controlled but activate due to naturally generated pressure differentials during the engine cycle. The motion of the cylinders is controlled and linked to the central drive shaft by means of a set of non-circular planetary gears which maintain their timing and reference through coupled circular planetary gears. The oscillating motion of one of the central non-circular gears can be seen in this cross-sectional view. The supercharger scavenged two-stroke engine cycle can be seen in this maximum compression sequence, achieving a compression ratio of approximately 22. Combustion shown in red expands the combustion chamber, while a new charge of clean air shown in blue is compressed in the supercharger. Near the end of the combustion stroke, the exhaust valve opens and exhaust is vented, shown in orange. With the decrease of pressure in the combustion chamber, the intake valve opens and the compressed clean air scavenges the chamber, forcefully venting remaining fumes. The exhaust valve closes shortly after the end of the combustion stroke, causing the closure of the intake valve and compression begins shown in yellow. Also at the beginning of compression, a pre-mixed charge of fuel shown in magenta is injected. Close to the end of the compression stroke, an igniting charge of fuel is injected and the cycle repeats. If the exhaust valves are held open slightly longer, less of the scavenging charge of air is retained, resulting in a lower compression ratio. In this sequence, the valves are held open long enough to drop the compression ratio to approximately 16. Notice that the combustion stroke is always longer than the compression stroke, and as air is provided by means of a supercharger, this engine by nature exhibits the powerful and efficient Miller cycle, but in a compact two-stroke configuration. In this sequence, the exhaust valves are held open long enough to drop the compression ratio to approximately 8, with significantly less of the charge of air retained for compression. The exhaust valves can be held open for the majority of the upstroke, resulting in a significantly reduced compression ratio if an easy spin start is desired. 
The exhaust valves are controlled by means of valve lifters on cam rods coupled at both ends to rotating cams. The upper rotating cam is fixed with respect to the central shaft and is responsible for initiating the opening of the exhaust valves. The position of the lower rotating cam is variable controlled by an adjustable set of rings coupled to a ramp that generates a delay in the activation of the lower valve cams. When the lower cam position matches the upper cam, minimum exhaust valve open time results in maximum charge and compression, in this case for a compression ratio of 22. When the lower cam position lags behind the upper cam, the exhaust valves remain open longer for reduced charge and compression, in this case for the compression ratio of 16. Increased lag in the position of the lower cam further reduces the charge and compression, in this case for the compression ratio of 8. With maximum lag in the position of the lower cam, the compression ratio is reduced to nearly zero for an easy spin start. This section through the combustion piston assembly shows the direct injection fuel system driven by microcontroller actuated solenoids. Also prominent in this section are the exhaust ports and pipes which deliver heat to the boiler situated above. The coolant pipes also circulate coolant to heat exchangers in the boiler. The complete action of one of the superchargers can be seen in this section along with the delivery of natural gas through fuel compressors up to two fuel injectors. This vertical section through the supercharger piston assemblies shows the unrestricted intake vents for both air and low pressure fuel. The exhaust valves and their cam controlled valve lifters are exposed here as well as the coolant channels. The fuel compressor valves are also visible. The two gearboxes are lubricated with gear oil, which is kept separate from the lubricant for the combustion chamber components. Modified peristaltic pumps and the rotating planet yokes drive the gear oil toward the hollow central shaft, which then distributes the pressurized oil to the bearings and gears of the gearboxes. Another modified peristaltic pump in the lower half of the engine sprays an oil chosen for lubricating hot surfaces onto the pistons and cylinder walls. Conventional compression rings and oil rings on the pistons maintain proper lubrication and keep the oil out of the combustion chambers. All that in a quiet, dependable, compact package.